Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Seven years, eight years, I've been with you guys, and uh, I'm getting to know some of you new, but I know some of these old folks here, and, uh, and they're still here. Old, not in age, but old, meaning they've been in, in here for a while, and uh, following the dream. Yes. And uh, man, what a beautiful presence of the Lord, and um, uh, there's always a, a, a spirit of excitement and revival here. I, I knew this seven years ago that this building is not going to do it. I didn't say that today, I said this seven years ago, and Brother Henderson <laughs> knew that too. So I, I thank God for what he's doing here, and um, always good to be with my friend. I, I really appreciate this man, it's been a... Uh, uh, an inspiration, and I have told about your pastor to some pastors, friend of mine, and I said there are not uh, many people who I have met that have a, a very strong character. Uh, you know, you can be impressed with charisma, but not character. And uh, now I didn't say he's a strong man in the sense that you probably thought about which is good. We need some solid, strong men nowadays, I can tell you that. But he's a strong man of uh, valor and character. And I, uh, as I grow older, I, I really appreciate that more than anything else because I realize that's the, the foundation of everything that we, we become. Yes. So thank God for Brother Anders. Sister Anders, it's good to see you. You weren't here last time I was here. God bless you. God bless you. These are awesome people, and I mean it, and I mean it, and I mean it. Well, with, with Pastor, I want to welcome our visitors. If you're here, I don't know everybody who's who, but if, thank you for coming. I have a word for you, and we're going to put it there. Uh, let me see if they got it right so I don't preach something different. All right, there we go. Um, you've been wondering what that is. I'll tell you in a moment. But uh, in the meantime... Um, I want to say I just got this this week. This is my third reprint of fourth. I don't remember. Anyway, it's my book. I recommend this book to everybody, whether you're a leader or not. This I think I shared this with you. I don't know if I really, I did. But this is a book I wrote because, um, of course, I am, um, my master is in, uh, my master's degree is in leadership, but also my PhD is now in leadership. But I want to. I wanted to share some things with the church because we want everybody to be a leader, but we just don't teach everybody leadership. We just teach it to the people that we are close to or they're working. But what if everybody will become and think like and act like a leader? And this is a, a good book about decision making, about compromise, how we think, how do we think uh, like a uh, man or a woman that wants to achieve great things. I only have 10 with this uh, with me, and Brother John has got 10 copies. You're welcome to get one if you like. Do you have my book? There you go, bro. Just take it. Just take it. Read it. Let me know what you think. And, uh, and it's only $10. You're welcome to get afterwards if you like. So I recommend that. And, but I thank God for what he's doing in the land. You know what? I was looking at the church, and I'm thinking, man, they sure need a building, larger, bigger. And you, you're the third church in the last two, three weeks to have the same problem. I'm telling the church is doing well. Don't let the world fool you. Don't let the world and the news fool you that the church is going down. Ain't going down. I assure you that it ain't going down. It's not going down. Um, I travel all over this country overseas, and I'm telling you, they, in fact, overseas, speaking of overseas, there's another problem. The problem, the major problem is they don't have a building <laughs> because they're growing. And, um, and I know the news don't, do not confirm that, and, uh, but uh, it's a lie, and I'm telling you the church is well. Our church is well. The church of the living God is well. And I'm excited about what God is doing. All right, let's go to the word of the Lord. Uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 3. Good to see uh, some of you that I've known now for many years. Thank you for being here and, and supporting your pastor and his great visions. Um, 
Let's go to Exodus chapter 14, verse 3. You probably have heard this many times, uh, but I use this as a basis. And if you're here visiting, just like Pastor said, believe as the word is preached. Yes. Because you don't have to wait the end of the service to get blessed, healed, saved, receive the Holy Ghost, get baptized. You don't have to wait for the end of the service. It can happen at any given time. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. And verse 10, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Exodus chapter 15, you don't have to get there. Verse 9, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My life shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. I want to talk to you about this simple thought this morning. The king has one more move. The king has one more move. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate your presence in this place. God, touch every man, every woman, every child, and every visitor. God, I pray that you will help us receive this word and do a work in the Holy Ghost, we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Would you lift up your hands one more time and begin to pray the name of the Lord? Would you praise him a little bit? I feel like we need to lose up a little bit. I feel like the Lord is here to help us, and I believe it's going to give us direction. It's going to deliver us. It's going to give us a word from heaven. Woo, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. you may be seated. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, sometimes we come to the house of the Lord and we feel like we don't have the right to praise him. And, um, and uh, it, is, um, it is a condition that sometimes can refrain the church from really uh, getting into the presence of the Lord because we feel guilty about something. That's why sometimes I feel like we have to open up services with a spirit, with a prayer of repentance because it's the best way to get better and get closer to God. No way at the end of the service. We have to struggle through all that mess. And then at the end we repent and we are struggling. But I, I tell you one thing. Don't let the devil and his mother-in-law fool you. You have the right to worship God. You have the right to lift up your hands. I don't care how you feel. I don't serve God because of my feelings. I serve God because he has forgiven me and he is my God. I serve him because the word of the Lord says so. Everything that has breath, praise ye the Lord. Woo. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. If the Bible says so, I do so. I, I, I'm telling you, we, don't, we can live for God by feelings. It's like being married. You cannot... Uh, manage your marriage by feelings because one morning you want to get up and kill him and kill her and the next day you want to love him or you want to resurrect him but you already killed him. So, because our feelings are funny, are funny and we are influenced by so many things that come to us. Sometimes our moods can determine the state of our being and so you, that's why you can rely on your emotions. That you can. You can you cannot base your life on emotions, baby. You just can't. And, I, and I'm telling you, it's important you understand that because that's what we do. We make a lot of decisions based on emotional moments. And we make great mistakes. And then we got a baby out of wedlock. And we don't know who the father is, who the mother is because we were emotional. And, and then there was this and there was that. And, and you go to church, you feel like the devil has done something to you. And you don't want to go to church. You let the emotions drive your decision. Honey, I, I, don't, I can't serve God by emotions. 
I got to serve God because that's what the Word says. I'm not going to adjust my theology based on my condition. The condition has to adjust itself because of my theology. And I'm going to serve God whether I like it or not, I feel it or not, because it's still my God. He has still forgiven me, and he has filled me with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Make no mistakes. There are times I don't want to go to church. I don't feel like it, right? You get up in the morning and you say, my God, I don't feel like going to church. What a, 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 Emotionally driven and it's no good. I want to tell you, you've got to be rooted in the word of the Lord. I don't know what I'm saying that. But I feel like the Holy Ghost is telling me, be rooted in the word of the Lord. Be committed to the word of the Lord. Be committed to the house. Be committed to God. I'm in a covenant with him. He told me, I got your back, and I'm going to have to do whatever I can to get his back covered. And that's the way covenant works. We are in this together. Either we fight together or we die together. Right. And I, I'm telling you, it's, it's we're living in a world that's very confused and, and it's not committed to much. And I want to tell you one thing. We, we cannot let our emotions and feelings and conditions dictate who we are. Don't let nobody frame you. Don't let nobody tell you who you are based on the trends of this world. Can I just go a little farther? I'm no Google. I'm no Apple. I'm not, I'm not Facebook. And I'm not Instagram. I'm a born again Christian. Don't let, don't let what I like fool you for who I am. I'm nothing of that. I don't want to have any. Oh, God. Glory to God. Glory to I'm a Christian. I'm an apostolic. I'm a Pentecostal. Born again, spirit filled. Praise God. Don't confuse me with the trends. I'm, I'm, my identity is unique. It's of my own. It's distinctive. When you see me, you don't see another guy. You don't see another young man. You don't see another marriage. You don't see another person. You don't see another church. Don't confuse me with the mass. I am a born again, spirit filled, blood bought, Christian, Pentecostal, in and out. Ooh, glory to God. Distinctiveness is important. But anyway, I don't, I don't want to get on all that. But I, I just felt like I needed to share this. With. Now you've been wondering, what is this, Brother Platini? I don't know. Well, I didn't know that until a few months ago I ran into this picture. And I began to read what was the story behind it, which is an amazing story. And all the details are not necessarily correct details. But the story in itself is a true story that took place back in the 60s, mid 60s, I understand. Well... The author, we don't know now if the painter, the artist, when he really painted this, really knew what he was doing. We don't know, at least for what I've read. But the painter uh, wanted to uh, uh, reveal or kind of express the conflict between humanity and, um, and the devil. And then... Uh, a conflict between the uh, underworld and, and humanity. And again, a conflict between evil and good. And this is what the, was the way he expressed it because he felt like that life is, can be um, somehow uh, can relate to, uh, that, that's of course from a worldly way of, of seeing it, a game. It's a, it's a game and, and whoever wins the game wins over things in life and 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 that's why the chess is right in the middle between these two entities now this is the story that really got my attention um this painting years ago many years ago was um it was actually um at the louvre at the louvre in paris and uh, but then after a few years maybe a few a couple years that they, the, the painting was removed and, and placed in a storage uh, at the Louvre. And the reason why they do that is because there are so many great masterpieces, uh, uh, pieces, great pieces of art so that they have to replace them occasionally uh, on a on a on a uh, viewed viewed as an important piece, of course. But again, there are other pieces that may be more important, so they have to replace them. And so 
But before that happened, this was actually, this piece could have been seen at the Louvre if you would have ever been there in Paris, France. And, and um, the story tells us that there was a group of people, of men, that went to, but the Henders, they went to, to Louvre, to the Louvre, to, to kind of see the collections, of course, the Louvre uh, offers. And uh, there was a group of people that walked by the painting and stopped for a moment and took a quite, you know, a close look at it and, and then proceeded to go and see the others. But one man didn't. And the man who didn't apparently was one of the greatest chess champion in the world. And uh, whether now he was a Russian or an American, we don't know. But the story tells he was a Russian chess champion. Now, how many love to play chess? One, two, three, four. Okay, you're not going to make it to heaven. Because <laughs> chess hurts my brain. They try to teach me chess, Brother Henderson. I think I lost about five minutes. I don't want anything to do with this. This is too much thinking. Can we play checkers? I like, I may love checkers. That's what I'm talking about. So I, I tried to learn chess, but it didn't work. But you guys who know how to play chess, I, it's a strategy game. I know, but it's, it's, it gets a little. See, see, this guy's got a headache right here. And that's. Yeah, you, you gotta you gotta really know how to. Now I know, of course, enough to tell you that the, the main thing is you gotta shelter and protect the king, and then of course the knights and the bishop, all those guys, gonna do the work and they're gonna try. Because if you get the king, of course, he checkmate the the your your adversary and you're out of the game. But when this man carefully watched this game and this table and this strategy here, he was puzzled because as a chess champion, he was thinking strategically and this painting actually is called the checkmate, meaning that apparently he checkmate this man. So the devil and evil and whatever it represented as evil checkmate this man, which is represents you, me, humanity, the world, good. And he was there pondering and pausing for a moment. And he carefully paid attention to the table. And then as a champion would, and he's, how he's cunning and is, of course, strategically driven and understanding, finally began to understand that there was a problem with the game. And he screamed out of his, uh, out of his, out of his discovery, it is wrong, it is wrong, it is wrong. Yeah. And everybody else that had been with him in the group came back and said, what do you mean it's wrong? And he said, I have watched carefully this, this, this table and I, have, and I have thought how he or he or the other would, would respond. And, I, and he said, I know it looks a checkmate, but actually he said, and this is only a champion can determine this, if you play right, the king has one more move to make. Have you ever been in a place in life where you have told yourself there is no way out of this? There's no way I can escape this. There's no way I can turn around to this. There's no way I can checkmate my own issues. There is no way that I can overcome it. There is no way I can win it. There is no way I can contradict the doctor's report who said I have no choice or chance. Have you ever been to a place where in life it seems like the enemy is checking you out, is checkmating you out? Have you been to a place in life where you think I'm locked up? There is no way out to this. There's no way I can win this. There's no way I can turn this thing around. There is no way I can get my kids back. There is no way I can get my marriage back. There is no way I can get my job back. Have you ever been to a place in your life where you know there is something I can do about this. I wish I had the way out. I wish I had the chance. I wish I had the answer. But you found yourself locked up and feel like you are about to lose it. But I gotta, oh God, I gotta 
an answer for you this morning. It is wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong because God has one more move. I know it looks impossible. I know it looks hard to believe it. I know there is no way out going forward and there is no way out going backward. But I got an answer from heaven. The king has one more move. To Come on, let's give God some praise. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't get discouraged. It may look bad, but it's not bad enough for God. He may look impossible, but it's not impossible for God. Ooh. You see, Israel, sit down for just a moment. You see, Israel found himself locked up between two evils. And he said that the, 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 the Egyptians are chasing us down. They're going to kill us all. And in front of us, we got this a Red Sea that we cannot surmount, we cannot cross. There's no way of escape. And I believe me, if I would have been there in their midst, I would have said, "We're dead. We're done for. It's over. There's yeah. no, there is no option. No matter, no matter what you look, no matter what you, what, what are you trying to think? There is no way. If you go forward, you drown. If you go backward, you get killed. What do you do? What do you do? Wait upon the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look up, because your salvation is gonna come. Right. And I know it seems impossible, but God can make a way in the impossibility that you have given up on. And he opened up this Red Sea and allowed the Israelites to walk on dry ground. Can I just say this to you? If you're discouraged and you feel like there is no way forward and there's no way out, the king has one more move to make and he will make the move right where you believe and you think that he cannot make it. He will open the Red Sea for you and he will allow you to walk on dry ground. He will send an army to your rescue if it's necessary when you feel like you've been overtaken. Right, right. The king has one more move to make. You yes. see, this is why life is going to sometimes trick us because watch this. You gotta, now, I'm not a, a, a profound artist, you know, driven, uh, you know, um, uh, knowledgeable guy. I like art like you all. Like. I mean, I like it just like you like it. And I think if I talk enough, I get myself in trouble. But I enjoy art. Some art I enjoy more. I remember I never, I wanted to be an artist. Last time I read about a painter who had a dot, a dot in the middle of a white canvas and he sold for millions. And I told my wife, I can do this. In fact, in, instead of one dot in the middle, I can put two or three. <laughs> There's something about art that I don't understand. You know, they look at that dot and they say, oh, and they give themselves a philosophical explanation. I don't know about the explanation. All I know is he just took a little mark, put, you know, mark and put a dot in the middle and he made two, three million dollars out of it. I'm fixing to put dots all over the place. I don't people just crazy. <laughs> Actually, this is, but Anders, this is one that I already ordered, and I'm going to have it in my room, in my home, because I like this. And the reason why I like it is because this is a reminder that the devil is a liar. That's right. That's right. That's right. That the devil is trying to confuse you. Right. That the devil is trying to tell you there is no way out. Right. There's no way you can turn away. There's no way you can get saved. There's no way you're going to get the Holy Ghost. There's no way you're going to get baptized. There's no way you're going to turn your life around. There's no way you're going to get healed because the game makes you believe that it's about over. But you're so blind. This is what happens when we are intensively in, 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 with, in a conflict with ourselves, with the things, with the facts. We are blinded. Have you ever been so blinded about your problems that you don't even see the solution that's next door? Let me give you a Bible. Let me give you a Bible. Let me give you a Bible because i got a lot of Bible to give you on this. Here comes 
a man who is, stands at the pool of Bethesda. He is sick, is powerless, is paralyzed partially for 38 years, if I'm mistaken. And he's looking at the waters because the, according to the legend, once a year the waters will be troubled. And if you can jump into the water and be the first one, you can get healed. And his eyes are fixed on it because he's hoping that this worldly concept can relieve him, can, can help him feel better and be better. And so his eyes are fixed on the world's answers, the world's ways to give you an option, the world's way to give you a way out. And he's fixed, and his eyes are fixed like everybody else in the pool. And Jesus, the creator of the universe, the one who made us, the one who spoke everything into existence, decides to walk into that pool and sees the man and says, hey, what would you like for me to do for you? I mean, it's like, it's like I don't know who, maybe the president of the United States will come and say, anything you ask, it, I can give it to you. That's what Jesus told the man. And the man is said, excuse me, Jesus, I'm busy. Excuse me, I don't know who you are, but I'm busy because... I need some healing. Excuse me just a sec. I need healing. I need, a, I need to get out of this situation I'm in. But I, excuse me, church. I don't have time for you. Oh, I'm just looking for an answer that comes from a world, a way of thinking. Excuse me. Excuse me, preacher. I don't have time for you. I'm just looking for my answer. Have you ever been blinded to the, play, to the point that when the answer is offered, you can see it? Just like this man, he's so confused and puzzled about him about to lose that he can see that the king has one more move to make. I want to tell every visitor, every saint, Every young man, every young person, I don't know what your situation is, but don't be blinded by your circumstances because even though you can see it, even though you cannot manage it, even though you don't know the answer, I'm telling you, Jesus has one more move. He can make and change everything. You might say, uh, preacher, I don't know. I don't know if God can save me. I don't know if God can turn me around. I don't know if God can really put my life back together. It's so messy, so bad. I don't know if God can fill me. I don't know if God can really save me. You're just like the man of the pool of Bethesda, so conditioned by your own conditions that you can even see Jesus come and walk into your life and say, I'm ready for you. And you're looking at that chess game and he's thinking oh god this looks so bad this looks so it's not resolvable it's just not solvable it's just not i don't see the way out i don't know how to do this i don't know how to pay my bills i don't know how to put my marriage back together i don't know how to get my kids back i don't know how to get my husband back if you want to get him and, and, and uh, <laughs> you may want to live in what he's at but uh, just kidding just kidding have you been to a place where you're so focused on your... When I, see, when I was at the hospital a few years ago and they cut me from here all the way down to my belly button, uh, that's called heart surgery, <laughs> open heart surgery. By the way, the, this actually is a violation of, of conduct, but the uh, surgeon was so close to me, we, we really got hit, you know, we really got friends. He, he recorded my heart surgery. It's a good thing they didn't record the beginning. Because that wouldn't have been very nice. <laughs> but he gave me, he said, Frank, I, gave, I, got, I got a gift for Don't tell anybody because this is really against the law, a medical world. They, they cannot do that. But he said, he gave me a little DVD, a little, little clip of my surgery. I'm telling you, I saw my heart. And it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes like this. Hello, 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 hello. What a what a deal. What a deal. <laughs> hey, hey, might as well try to get the best out of the mess. That's pretty good. You know? My grandchildren are going to see this. My grand-grandchildren are going to see this. Wow. <laughs> None of you has anything like that. Come on now. I'm good. messing with you this morning. But when the doctor, Brother Anderson, told me, this, is, this was after 
the, surg the surgery, and he didn't, it didn't look good, you know, because I had uh, infection that went straight to the brain, brain you know, blood, bl I mean, brain bleeding uh, issues. It was a mess, let's put it this way. And I felt just like this man here at the table thinking, oh, God, there's no way out to do it. So bad. Listen, it was so bad that we started making arrangements for the funeral when I was back in Italy. And you may remember that because I think you guys prayed for me. And I was in Italy back then doing mission work. And all of a sudden, I ended up at the hospital for six months, or four, five, five months. At the hospital, three different department units. It was a mess. It was such a mess that I was chosen to become a, an, a, a learning experience to the medical world in, at the university. The, the, the professor and the director of the chair told me, do you mind coming? Because your case is so complex. We want to use you. As, as, an, as, a, as a, an object of lesson for what we're going to learn in the future. Said, as long as you don't cut me, it's fine. <laughs> don't dissect me and try to show everybody, you know. And that's how bad it was. But he said, it looks better. We don't know how to f stop this bleeding because the more it goes into your brain, it's going to kill you. Or at the worst, it's going to leave you dumb. And I said, that's not a problem. <laughs> that's, I I'm used to that. <laughs> But I don't want to die that fast. <laughs> and so he walked in and he gave me those bad news. And so I, I, I didn't know what to do. I felt like this man. I said, God, I don't see a way out to this. I pray. People have prayed. If it's my hour, okay. I think well, I, I still have to do a little work. I want to start a church in Rome. In Italy, where I'm from, I want to start a church down there. I want to do this. I want to do that. God, I mean, it's too quick. I thought I was dead. Then the same doctor walked in and said, Franco, I don't know how, but it's like this. This is exactly what he said. It's like somebody walked into your brain. This is what he said. And put a finger on your current issue and stop the bleeding from recurring. That's exactly what he said. If I had known this story, I would have told him, doctor, Thank you for letting me know because I believe that Jesus had one more move to make even though he looked bad and he looked terrible and looked like there was no hope. Maybe, maybe we should start practicing our faith experience and next time you walk into a bank, and walk into your doctor's office and they don't want to give you a loan and they don't want to, you know, and the report hasn't changed. Maybe you need to leave the room and say, you know what? It's like this chess game, checkmate yes. business. I believe God has one more move to make. I'll see you next week. <laughs> You never know. You never know what God can do. You never know. It's like when Lazarus was dead and everybody panicked and everybody was crying. And, and here comes Jesus. Excuse me. Excuse me. Everybody, excuse me. Quit crying. I don't, I don't need drama up in here. Okay. I don't need drama. I need solutions. So if you just, and I need somebody who believes and has faith. If you don't have faith, I don't need you to increase the problem. I already know the problem. I just need to walk in and I need somebody to follow me that believes with me so we can practice this faith business. And so we, he walked into the tomb, stood before the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out of there because I still haven't made my move. Everybody buried you. Everybody give you, you know, can I, can I just tell you something? You know, you know the story. The reason why Jesus waited the fourth day to get there, as you know, based on the law of the land, only three days after that, the, the burial, you could confirm a, uh, 
a definite death. That's why right. Jesus waited right. three days. Right. It wasn't by accident. It's because he wanted to make sure that when he got out of the tomb and when he got Lazarus out of the tomb, that people wouldn't say, oh, well, he was within those three days and, his, and people can right. come back to life within three days. But after three days, it's assured, it's determined that he is dead. Sometimes God waits the fourth day. Sometimes God's waiting until it gets really bad and right. says, now it's my way. It's my time. It's my move. And I'm going to make one more move. Daniel thought he was dead in the lion's den. But one more move God had to make. The three Hebrew children were in the furry, furry uh, furnace. And, 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 and it was hot. It was terrible. It was final. But they didn't know God had one more move. You know, I, I, I mean, we can talk over and over and again. I mean, over and over. And, and we, can, we can say more. We can share more stories. But I like, I like what this angel is doing here. Now, I don't know. I don't know how you read a paint, a painting. I don't know how you read an uh, art. But I tell you one thing. I know one thing. I might, be, I might not be intelligent, but I'm, I'm not stupid. This angel, this guardian is looking at him and not at him. So that tells me somebody is watching over you and somebody is giving you a hint. Don't give up. Don't quit. You got one more move. Don't worry about it. I got you covered. I got you covered. Don't worry about it. Just keep believing. Keep believing. Keep praying. Keep coming. Keep trusting. Come on, I believe somebody needs this word this morning. God has one more move for you. It's not done yet. It's not over yet. Your healing can come this morning. Your miracle can be. Oh, God. Musicians come. Musicians come. I know, I know we're going to need a building here soon. And you say, man, brother, you understand, you know, it's what it is. We just have to, okay, let's wait on the Lord. But make no mistakes. Hallelujah. God can make a move that can blow us away. Yes. Right. Your doctor's report looks bad. Your job situation looks dark. And your family situation looks rokey. And, you know, it's a little funny. And, and you've got kids on drugs and... Oh, and it looks hopeless. It looks hopeless. I, I talked to a friend of mine a long ago. He's been married about 25 years. He said, Frank, I need you to pray. He said, why? He said, because my marriage is about done. I said, you're 25 years into a marriage. Why would you want to start again? I mean, you must be out of your mind, man. I said, well, it's, I just, we just can't figure this out. And, and 25 years, we're stressed. We, we, uh, we just come into a place in our life. I said, oh, no, no, don't do this. Don't do this. Yes, don't do this. Because I believe the king has one more move. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And he did yes. move. And 25 years later, the couple's still together. I want to tell you one thing. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. The game is a trick. The conditions are not what they seem to be. Maybe they look that bad when you look at them. And just like the Israelites, they said, man, we are, we're, they're going to slaughter us. So we, we, it, It's over. It's over. We can't go anywhere. But they had forgotten that God was with them all the way all the way to the end sometimes we don't see him sometimes we don't feel him but that's what he has said to us like David said you know what though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death I know he'll be with me I might not see him through the valley I might not see him through the stress I might not see him and feel him but I know he's there somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. And he still has one more move.
to me. I'm going to close with this. I love the story of the prodigal son, and I know we have to deal with backsliders. And that doesn't mean they have gone away from Sometimes they can be sitting here. We don't even know. Their heart is gone for a while. And I, I, I was reading this, Brother Henderson, and I, I, for the first time in 33 years of ministry, can you believe that? I realized why the father was running to embrace the son. See, I thought it was an act of love because that's his son. So his son is coming back after he refused to obey him. His boy left and said, Dad, I want my money, and I'm out of here. And he went and spent all this money with girls. Remember the story? I mean, had a party until he ran out of money, and then everybody left him. Big lessons to learn there. And, and then he, said he found himself lost without hope, without anything. And he said, I'm going home. I'm going back to my daddy. And I'm going to tell him to forgive me because I was stupid. I did the wrong thing. The problem is that according to the Shammai law of the land, that boy could have been dead. And he should have been dead. And that stoning, stoning the boy, would have belonged to the elders of the city. Because the elders knew that the, the son had violated a law in itself. And, and had humiliated his father. So when he was coming toward the city, the elder would have had the right to stone him and kill him if he would have crossed the doors of the city. That is the reason why the father was running like crazy. Yes, because right. before that's the right. elders would stone him to death, the father had to embrace him, hug oh, him, yeah. shelter him, yeah. and let the elders know, I got him. I got him. I got him. You can do this. I got him. He's forgiven. You can touch him. The king has one more move to make. You don't know when he's coming. You don't know what he's going to do. But he's going to be there for you. He's there to protect you. He's there to heal you. He's there to bless you. One more move can change it. Let's stand with me. If you're visiting this morning, and maybe you're just a visitor, I want to tell you, you may feel like there's no hope for you. Maybe you can't. You feel like there's no way I can turn away from all of this. Can I just tell you again, there's one more move God is going to make. If you come to this altar and you repent of your sins, God can deliver you, free you, fill with the Holy Ghost. Don't be like the man of the pool of Bethesda. I'm too busy trying to get myself saved when salvation is right there next to you. If you got a situation in your family and you think it's irreparable, you think there's no way out. Listen, listen to me. The devil didn't call you to be his children to finish you up. It is a trick of the devil. And there is a way out. I don't know how he's going to do it. And I don't know when he's going to do it. But I know one thing. He's going to say this to you one of these days. It's wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong. There's one more move I'm going to make. One more move I'm going to make. This altar is open. And I know we want to take a moment to talk to God. Say, Lord. Is there really one more move you can make? Is this preacher really right? Is the word of the Lord right? Yes, it is. Because Daniel made it. The three Hebrew children made it. The Israelites made it. There is always one more move that God is going to make to help you and deliver you and fill you and bless you. I'm telling you, one more move, one more move can change everything. I want you to come to this altar. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for your healing. We're going to pray for your miracle. We're going to pray with you for your answer. Because I believe I've come this morning to let you know God has one more move to make. Don't let the world fool you. Don't let the conditions fool you. Don't let the circumstances discourage you. I know it looks bad. I know it looks like there is somebody watching over you. There is a God watching over you. There is a God that says, don't be perplexed. Don't be discouraged. Don't be, don't be afraid. Because
because I'm watching you. I'm over you. I got your back. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to help you. There is power in the name of Jesus. Come on. Lift up your hands.